Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our webcast this morning. I'm Jerry Scow, Vexcel's Director of UltraCam Cells for North America. And I'm joined this morning by Drew Marin and Adam McCulloch from Quantum Spatial Inc., who are going to present on a couple of showcase aerial data projects that they've completed using their Vexcel imaging UltraCam systems. Uh, following their presentation, we'll have a question and answer period. Uh, so as we go along, please feel free to use the Q&A feature uh, in, here in Zoom to ask any questions that come to mind. The webcast is being recorded and a link to that recording will be sent out to all attendees so that you can review the presentation again later and uh, share with your colleagues and industry contacts who you think might benefit from this information. Uh, before I hand over the reins to Drew and Adam, just a few words about the Vexel Imaging UltraCam sensors uh, that are at the heart of the projects that they'll be discussing. Uh, I'll be brief and very top level, uh, but for those of you who may not already be aware, Vexel Imaging has an entire family of large format aerial sensors. Um, this includes our UltraCam Condor, uh, our UltraCam Osprey, UltraCam Falcon, and UltraCam Eagle. Uh, the Condor is seen here top and center is a wide area mapping system that uh, features an extremely large footprint, 38,000 pixels across the flight path, uh, which makes for highly efficient data capture over, over large regions, uh, such as statewide or national imagery collects. Pictured to the left of that is the UltraCam Osprey. Uh, that's our uh, dual system, let's say dual purpose system, that simultaneously captures nadir imagery for traditional photogrammetric applications as well as 45 degree oblique imagery for applications such as 3D mapping. We've just actually uh, recently announced a new version of the uh, Osprey. Uh, and in a moment, I'll have a slide with some high level information about that. Uh, first, I wanna discuss our photogrammetric nadir systems, the uh, UltraCam Eagle in particular, uh, which is the system owned and operated by Quantum Spatial. Uh, but first up, uh, the UltraCam Falcon. Uh, which is available in two different models and operated uh, uh, by a large number of OrchCam operators across the U.S. Uh, the first system is the Mark I. Uh, it's our more or less entry-level large format system for uh, small and medium-sized projects. And the Mark II, a bigger capacity, more efficient system that's better suited for larger collections. These systems are offered with either a 70 millimeter or 100 millimeter focal length lens. Um, for flight missions of varying altitudes. But once selected, please note that the, uh, the lens kit is fixed. Uh, conversely, the UltraCam Eagle offers four optional lens kits that could be exchanged in a clean hangar environment by uh, customers trained operators. It's roughly a three hour process uh, after which no recalibration is necessary uh, to be off and flying again, collecting photogrammetric grade imagery um, and, um, and producing just stunning detail, accurate imagery. The benefit of course of that is that this allows the Eagle to serve uh, as a single sensor that can fly projects of differing flight altitudes, but still take full advantage of the Eagle's huge footprint at any given uh, altitude. And uh, note that despite this uh, large footprint that you see on the screen here, Eagle's fast frame rate means that um, our customer is able to quickly and efficiently complete their projects and with high overlap, uh, but no motion blur uh, given the forward motion compensation through TDI, time delayed integration. And in fact, um, all UltraCam systems feature forward motion compensation. Uh, they all also collect panchromatic, RGB, and near infrared imagery all in the same pass. This, along with the large footprints, the fast frame rates, the different focal lengths are uh, in part uh, how we deliver on our promise to continuously produce industry leading products uh, that are increasingly efficient, versatile and reliable and that consistently deliver unmatched uh, data quality. As mentioned a moment ago, we've introduced a new Osprey. Like earlier Osprey models, the Osprey 4.1 simultaneously collects photogrammetric grade nadir imagery that span RGB and near infrared, mind you, along with oblique imagery, all in the same pass. Uh, but thanks to new CMOS sensors, uh, the efficiency on this system is through the roof. Uh, the camera's pan footprint, which defines the, um, 
the flight collection and overall efficiencies is more than 20,000 pixels across in the Nadir mode. And for those of you who followed our uh, progress of our systems over the years, this makes the new Osprey even slightly more efficient for Nader collections uh, than the Eagle Mark I, a, mini that, uh, a system that many are still operating. Oblique uh, captures are also significantly bigger, and yet the system frame rate is now under one second, incredibly fast considering all the bands of data that are being collected uh, simultaneously. So there's a lot more to say about this system, but since it's not uh, particularly relevant to today's presentation, I'll only further say that we'll be holding a separate webcast on this system in the near future. So please uh, keep an eye out on your email inboxes for that announcement. Okay, last slide and then I'll hand it over to Drew. Um, no UltraCam discussion would be complete without at least touching on our software solution, UltraMap. Uh, UltraMap is also optimized for the UltraCam. Um, it's semi-automatic, it provides semi-automatic rapid processing of uh, UltraCam raw data to produce data products that include uh, radiometrically corrected, geometrically accurate, uh, and color balanced imagery, high density point clouds, uh, digital surface and train models, and ortho photos and 3D tins. Uh, Ultramaps uh, based on a distributed processing architecture so that users can spread the workload across multiple machines to process images in parallel. So uh, the more computer cores then that you apply to jobs, the faster the throughput. Additionally, Ultramap is modular in design uh, with each module available through purchase or subscription so that customers can purchase modules that they rely upon frequently and then subscribe to others that they need uh, either infrequently or just when they need additional licenses temporarily to bolster processing capacity during work periods. Uh, that's my presentation for this morning. I apologize for my erratic system moving through the slides uh, on its own. At this point, I'm going to hand over the presentation to Drew Marin from um, Quantum Spatial. Again, my name is Drew Marin uh, with uh, Quantum Spatial. We are a 650-plus uh, 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 organization uh, located all throughout North America, um, and I am based in the Northern Virginia office, uh, Dulles, Virginia, uh, of which I've been there for four years, and uh, uh, the project uh, that I will be talking about will be uh, Cape Cod and my counterpart on the West Coast in Alaska, Adam McCullough, will be talking about a project in Alaska. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Quantum Spatial, um, we are a very large geospatial uh, uh, company uh, located within North America, uh, providing end-to-end -end, uh, data and analytics um, from uh, uh, planning, acquisition, delivery, and all the derivative products that come from uh, uh, imagery. Uh, but for today's purposes, we're talking specifically about um, the acquisition of these types of projects. Uh, just a little bit more specifically about who we are. Um, we capture not only imagery, we uh, capture large amounts of um, LIDAR. We have UAS uh, capabilities, uh, mobile LIDAR, topobathymetric, which is water penetrating LIDAR. Um, as well as sensors in hyperspectral and thermal imagery. Along with all of that data and uh, multiple missions for clients, we do have an EGIS practice that complements the data that we collect for clients in and around uh, the country uh, that use our data and needs uh, a repository uh, or viewers for that type of data set that we capture. Um, we always like to have a nice uh, star there. We do have multiple national awards of which we can, you can always Google us and find out more about that. Um, a little bit more details on um, why our experience uh, and our services are matched. Um, uh, our office in, in the Dulles area has been around since the 1950s. So we have uh, well over 70 years of experience uh, providing end-to-end -end solutions, uh, providing high-quality data and geographic insights. Um, it, with the, in the last uh, 10 or 20 years, the technology has improved hand over fist year over year or sometimes every six months. Um, and with the, the M3 that has come out, um, it's just further showcasing uh, that needing to incorporate the latest technology uh, for the photogrammetry world 
um, is very appropriate is very uh, important. Um, we, uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, we have over 650 employees um, of which uh, uh, are all over the country, ranging in different age groups from uh, right out of college, uh, learning a little bit about compilation and production uh, to people of an industry 45, 50 plus years, uh, still doing uh, high quality work and supporting on multiple different levels. Uh, again, uh, we like to include, since we are a visual company, we like to include the visuals of the, of, uh, the slide previously that I mentioned about. Uh, not only do we capture imagery anywhere uh, within the North America and the Caribbean area, um, we produce some of the derivative products that come from that. And every once in a while, we come up with a very cool little uh, toy that we call our robot, which is an, an autonomous rover that's used for our utility clients and remote destinations. And here is our uh, geographical footprint of where we are uh, located. I am in the Dulles, Virginia office and Adam is in Anchorage, Alaska, which is probably our two farthest distances away from each other. Uh, so as we move into uh, my project, uh, capturing the Cape uh, with the UltraCam M3, um, uh, let me see. Um, the, the, the Cape Cod Commission is a combination of uh, the 15 towns that do incorporate uh, the Cape. For those of you who do not know, uh, Cape Cod is um, a, the, um, uh, I'll call it the American boot in, uh, in Massachusetts, um, in that it, uh, it's the easternmost, easternmost portion of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, the Cape Cod Commission has contracted us uh, their information is uh, is below with their mission to protect unique values and quality of life within the Cape by coordinating a balanced relationship between environmental protection and an economic progress. It's one of those uh, unique commissions that aren't necessarily around all over the country or the world where you have these individual towns pooling together through one commission to follow a common purpose. Uh, this was created in 1990, this commission, and they do have their own open data portal, as well as a GIS and geo design department of which we're contracting through. Uh, the object uh, of, uh, of the purpose in 2014, uh, the Cape Cod Commission um, uh, participated with um, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts uh, several uh, regional projects through uh, the USGS um, acquisition project. As you can see in the lower left passive, uh, portion of your screen, uh, it was a math ortho participants. And I forgot the total count, but it was north of uh, 50 uh, participants. I think we're up to, I think it was about 57 or 58 different towns. Um, it, it was a lot of tasking that went in. Um, at that time, the Commonwealth didn't have a statewide initiative for capture. So a lot of the towns needed to do regional approaches and it was very time consuming. Uh, the good thing is that the Cape Cod Commission was co combined. And so they just needed to reach out to their 15 towns to get uh, a, 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 the blessing on moving forward with it. And that's what they were able to participate in. Uh, so they did have to go through the USGS specs and contracting purposes for that. Um, uh, Quantum Spatial were not, was not uh, uh, the vendor for that project. So all this information was provided by uh, the Cape Cod Commission. Uh, in 2020, however, um, the uh, commission wanted to uh, pursue this at their own uh, uh, contract vehicle. Um, and so in 2020, they contracted uh, with us for uh, capturing imagery and de delivering uh, four band digital orthos um, at a three inch um, um, uh, quality. We did, um, uh, we did capture this data for the, uh, for the commission to also supply them, um, granted through a second contract, but to grant them with uh, planimetric data uh, that was captured from 2014. We are updating it. Um, there is a lot of development and redevelopment that goes on in the Cape every year. Um, and then there's also initiatives to work with uh, the Commonwealth um, as a whole 
to support regional uh, projects moving forward in the coming years to come. In terms of our approach, um, we, uh, from the beginning um, to our uh, proposal uh, of our quote to the actual capture and deliverable, we proposed the M3 the entire way. Um, I, I don't have the exact date of, uh, of purchase by Quantum Spatial. I'm just a lonely old salesperson, uh, but we, uh, I believe we uh, acquired the M3 uh, either earlier uh, in the year before. Um, and so having this at our discretion with the maintenance and uh, test flights are all being done, uh, capturing it and using this as part of the project was our uh, uh, main purpose for, uh, for, for providing it. And as you could see in what uh, Jerry was talking about earlier is one of the reasons why Quanta Spatial has uh, two of these current uh, sensors in their repository is for larger footprint capture with fewer flight lines uh, to reduce our time in the air and the amount of production uh, post acquisition. Um, the, uh, as I mentioned, we did fly at 7.5 centimeter um, at an altitude around 6,500 feet. I just realized I'm using uh, two different scales. Uh, so three inch imagery flown at 6,100 um, AGL. Um, a, a lot of people like knowing some stats, so we wanted to provide some, uh, so, some stats pertaining to this. Um, the Cape with uh, the area that was acquired was around 531 square miles. The Cape with additional water areas that had no uh, uh, land mass to it is around 165 square miles. I'm sorry, 565 square miles. So it's about 10% or 15% the size of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So it's a large chunk of area that is for Massachusetts. Um, as you could see in the previous slide, we had two major flight line paths, one from uh, east-west and one from a north-south type of direction, totaling 30, 37, 37 flight lines, um, 3,247 exposures that were used for the capture. Um, and then our flight window, um, as we all know, uh, is uh, leaf off conditions in uh, the New England or the northeast portion of the United States is um, anywhere from early February to late May. It, de it depends on um, when the, uh, the temperature can uh, uh, make the buds come out uh, sooner rather than later. Um, in, in this particular year, um, we had very warm weather in late, uh, mid-February and late February, and then it just got cold. Um, and so we were very fortunate that we had we had to hurry up all of our other uh, missions uh, to get to the area. And then when we captured it, it slowed down the temperature. So we had a nice little grace period of capturing it. Fortunately, uh, we planned for that. Um, uh, I will talk a little bit more about the dates and how it really uh, talks about uh, the current situation we're in with the pandemic. But in terms of the results, um, we did have a very dark image reveal more texture and detail. That wasn't done in the 2014. I have another screen after that. It will show a side-by-side uh, uh, -side comparison to it. Um, there were uh, some deep, deeper shadows, but uh, with the uh, newer sensor technology, there comes newer software technology that enhances um, that you can still be able to see the ground uh, during those times. Uh, we did capture on the early side of the season. Normally a capture season is in uh, usually April to the end of April. So we captured it on the earlier side, which was ideal for the Cape because um, when you are a peninsula, you tend to get foliage faster or sooner than in mountains, mountainous areas, which is in the Western portion of the Commonwealth. And this is what I was talking about in terms of a visual um, I think it's always good to go back and forth a few times. As you could see uh, in 2014, it was another three inch or 7.5 centimeter uh, image capture, um, a, a very good quality product, um, but it was uh, much more exposures, much more time on the ground and capturing it. Um, they did have uh, brightened it quite a bit. So there was a little bit of oversaturization, 
um, but it was to enhance the certain features that uh, the client at the time, the Commonwealth at the time, uh, or the commission at the time wanted to see. So as you can see, I, I always look at, I look at the dock that you could see in the upper left hand corner. And then in the middle of the, on the 2020, you could see the differences um, that you can see the planks themselves going all the way out. Uh, going to the time frame, um, at the, March 14th was uh, probably the first day or two uh, during the COVID-19 shutdown along the New England area, the Northeast portion of the United States with the outbreak happening in New York City and Boston um, uh, relatively at the same time. Um, um, Quantum Spatial is owned by an international um, engineering firm called NV5. Um, NV5 was per, uh, provided exemption uh, from workplace or travel restrictions. And with the uh, uh, professionalism from our pilots um, and uh, sensor operators who were actually in the area of the most hardest hit portions of the United States for this COVID outbreak, we did have this waiver and um, uh, took the restrictions uh, for each state uh, specifically. So if there were travel restrictions, they had to abide by that. Um, it did affect us on the uh, surveying side. Uh, we did need to wait until the restrictions were lifted for us to travel to the Commonwealth to do surveying, uh, but that was post acquisition. So on that note, I wanted to pass over a project that is all the way on the other side of the country. And Adam, are you on? And I will uh, take the reins and still navigating the slides, but you can talk from here. Yeah, thanks, Drew. Hi, this is Adam McCullough. I manage our geospatial programs in Alaska. And um, I'm gonna talk about uh, the other part of the country here, uh, an imagery capture we did over Tongass National Forest. Um, Drew, if you wanna advance. So Tongass is a, I mean, this is a, a very massive um, region here. And you can see it, you know, in green there, it effectively occupies the, the majority of the southeastern Alaska panhandle. Um, we always like to do a comparison of Alaska versus the U.S. to show how, uh, how impressively big we are. Um, but Tongass National Forest is on par with the, the uh, land mass of uh, West Virginia in size. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, not only is it a large area, but it's extremely remote in terms of access to resources. Uh, there are no arterial road networks connecting any of the islands that comprise the national forest. So we get there by aircraft or, or boat. Um, there's not a lot of access to aviation fuel. Um, breathable oxygen, some of the things that flight crews need to fly high and efficiently. Um, so it's, you know, it's always a challenging place to work. I got my start in this profession as a sensor operator. And one of the first projects I worked on was flying um, film camera imagery over Tongass. And um, it's, it's no small effort to get the, the, um, you know, the logistics figured out. And once you're on site, you're dealing with, um, pretty inclement weather. Uh, we don't have, you know, this is part of a, a temperate rainforest. So you can often see over a hundred inches of rain every year. So finding the right opportunity to collect imagery can be challenging. Uh, we can advance slides, Drew. So in 2019, uh, the Forest Service contracted three of the 10 ranger districts for imagery acquisition. So you can see a map here of the ranger districts in question. Overall, it was over 5.6 million acres of imagery. Uh, they required four band, 30 centimeter ground sample distance imagery, 60-30 front and side lap. Um, 40 degree sun angle was an important requirement. There's a lot of tall trees and uh, pretty intense relief in a lot of these areas. So shadows become a, a pretty major issue and so um, that 40 degree sun angle is a pretty important requirement to get good quality, bright, nice looking imagery. Um, unfortunately, it, it further constricts the, the uh, window of opportunity to collect. So it was another um, challenging variable to deal with. Uh, leaf on was a requirement and cloud free and snow free conditions. So, um, you know, this is an area that, um, 
you know, we'll get a lot of snow free throughout the winter on the coastal areas, but the snow in higher elevations uh, can linger on well into the summer. And the deliverable requirements were stereo imagery, digital ortho, quarter quarter quad angle tiles, and compressed project mosaics. Next slide. And our approach to to getting the acquisition done in you know one realistic flight season, uh, you know from the get go we decided to to put the UltraCam uh, Eagle M3 on it. Um, you know it's, it is our most capable frame based imaging sensor. Uh, we knew that we would need to be able to jump on any weather window that presented itself. So, um, you know, the M3 was kind of um, a foregone conclusion going into it. Um, we knew that the, you know, with the sun conditions, the snow conditions, that we'd really have um, a flight season that would be constricted to the end of May and, and first part of September. Um, and with the historical weather patterns, we anticipated only about a third of that uh, to be flyable days. Um, with the amount of flight hours that we anticipated, we thought we could be seeing as many as 140 days to collect. And so we're always thinking of that. How many aircraft do we need to deploy? Where can we stage them? Um, all those sorts of logistics. Um, and, uh, you know, we're not unlimited uh, got it out how to how to effectively attach each project um, and so we paired the ultra cam with one of our um, conquests uh, it was pressurized cabin it allowed the crew to fly at uh, 28,000 feet AGL uh, which is a you know, pretty high and um, they're flying very fast so when the conditions cleared they were able to to jump on this and um, make very good progress um, and with the ultra cams 450 megapixel collection capacity, um, you know, the one and a half second frame rate, uh, it was very efficient to, to, um, you know, put that sensor on this project and, uh, overall captured 328 flight lines and over 15,000 exposures. Next slide. So after a, uh, uh, successful flight season. Here's a look at the final ortho imagery products. Um, we acquired all three of the Ranger districts. We did get a little bit of clouds. You can see in the bottom right, there's one flight line that had a little bit of clouds. Um, that was less than 1% of the overall project, but we've, we've got to go back out there this year and uh, fill that in. Um, but the, you know, the ultra cam and the high altitude aircraft enabled us to acquire efficiently. Um, also the processing with fewer images, uh, goes a lot quicker and more efficiently and, um, allows us to enhance our QAQC process. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, we, we finished, um, before that first part of September, uh, luckily before we started losing usable sun angle. Next slide. And here's an example of the image product. This is a place called Swan Lake I wanted to highlight because it's a place I've been to. Um, if you ever get the chance to visit Tongass, I highly recommend it. There's a, a forest service cabin that you can, you can uh, reserve on recreation.gov, um, but it's an absolutely beautiful place with cascading waterfalls coming in and out of the lake. Um, but it's very uh, beautiful imagery all over the place. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Unfortunately, we were able to finish uh, last year's project and respond to additional tasking this year. So the Forest Service um, contracted with Quantum Spatial to add some additional ranger districts um, and also expanded the project into the Chugach National Forest, which is close to where I live and recreate. So I'm excited to get hands on that imagery. Um, and there were some, um, some fires last year that um, worked its way into portions of the Chugach National Forest. So I'd like to see the impacts of that as soon as we can get that imagery available to us. Uh, but this is a, another project that we're, we're using the UltraCam M3 on and um, plan to uh, continue using on, on this program. And we look forward to um, seeing additional Ranger districts come up for contract. Um, and uh, as they do, we'll happily use um, 
the Vexel technology on it. It's really been um, kind of a game changer for us. Uh, when I first used, um, you know, the older real film technology, we, we worked on Tongass and deployed four aircrafts, uh, took all summer. It was a really painstaking um, process. So being able to, you know, efficiently economize your, your fleet and um, focus the best technology on it is really game changing for us. And so with that, I think we'll uh, take some questions. So Adam and Drew, uh, a question has been asked about the processing time for these projects. I can, I can go first. Um, we acquired, uh, uh, it was a little bit of a tricky uh, uh, response in terms of processing time because we include um, uh, doing the surveying uh, as part of our processing uh, uh, project timeline and with the delay uh, because of COVID-19, it was a little bit longer. It took about an extra 10 or 15 days before the restrictions were lifted. Um, but the, uh, we have successfully delivered um, um, all the data. So uh, actually uh, earlier this month, so uh, with an acquisition in mid-April, um, with the delay in the um, um, surveying, we were able to deliver within a week of the uh, delivery date, even with the delay we had. So uh, between April 15th and July 15th uh, was the overall for the processing um, of everything, uh, including um, uh, the surveying, uh, initial QC of the data, um, production of the ortho, QC of the ortho, um, and delivery of the four-band ortho product. Very cool. Hey, I come to your guys' um, your symposiums every year that you have, uh, and there's a lot of other UltraCam operators uh, attending there. I, I, I know that you guys partner up quite a bit with uh, a lot of the other UltraCam operators when you have large projects. I assume for the, these projects right here, there, it was one sensor uh, used on, on each of these projects? I'll speak to mine first since I have my hot mic on still. Um, yes, uh, it was uh, a quantum spatial uh, M3 sensor that was used for this. Um, uh, quantum spatial um, is a fairly large organization with a robust um, uh, team to with many projects all around the country and with a fleet of 13 airplanes and 40 some odd sensors we can't be in every location of all time so we also have the largest partner network in the country uh, to work with us uh, either on acquisition surveying and or production where appropriate and I'll just speak to the Tongass project we did um, we, we collected with uh, quantum spatial sensor. Um, we did partner with Keystone and um, identified their UltraCam as a um, um, a sensor that we could use. Um, it, throughout the summer in Alaska, we were able to, um, you know, we, we found that you know our one platform was was enough to get the work done, um, and we we're able to use Keystone in in other geographies. So I think that partnership worked out pretty good. Great. Uh, next question, it is my, uh, from Tracy Shaw. It is my understanding that the optimum overlap for using Ultramap software is 80-60. And, and in fact, uh, that's what we at Vexel recommend uh, for doing photogrammetry. Uh, did you feel it took more operator work to have a good ortho product using 60-30? I have to go back, but I believe our product that we did for it was 60-40. But I have to double check on that. I don't have that in front of me here um, that we used uh, for that. Um, we did not have an issue uh, with it. I, I believe one of the main issues why we didn't have it is the Cape is very flat in that uh, it's one of those flat areas on the Eastern seaboard where there's not a big differential on anything. So um, I believe that's why we provided that 6040 solution and we did not have any issues uh, from it, but I have to double check and go back on my records on that one. Talk with my technical, technical team on that. Okay, great. Uh, next question from Jacob Hoffman. Can you tell us about the challenges, if any, of collecting and processing imagery collected at 28,000 AGL? I'm wondering about, I'm wondering if haze and moisture was a problem. 
Yeah, so in Tongass, we were collecting up at that altitude. Um, yeah, haze uh, certainly is an issue. Um, you know, more often than not, what happens, and this, you know, can happen at any altitude, is that 40 degree sun angle, um, you know, you can have nice, bright, early mornings, but you're not at sun angle. Um, and once you climb to altitude, which, you know, takes some time to get up that high, um, you can start seeing the, the cumulus clouds start to build up. And um, so what you thought was going to be a nice day of collection ends up being a, getting skunked out. So, um, but we didn't have any sort of atmospherics um, that we noted in the, the imagery at that altitude uh, when, the, when the conditions were right. Um, you know, without a pressurized cabin, um, I've, I've worked on projects flying at that altitude and it's, um, it was a major challenge. It's very taxing on the body to be, you know, hooked up to oxygen and um, having to work in those conditions and getting access to breathable oxygen tanks is, uh, is no small feat either in, in this part of the, of the country. Um, there's two communities where you can get the, the O2 supply and um, then, of course, you have to have it uh, either barged or shipped or transported somehow to where you're actually working. Um, so a lot of logistics come into uh, flying at that high. But with a pressurized cabinet, it uh, makes life a lot easier. Well, I'll tell you, I know your systems are, are both 100 millimeter focal length lens kits. And uh, I think I'm going to have to talk to John Whitman about getting you guys a 210 millimeter <laughs> length lens if you're going to be flying at those kind of altitudes. Yeah, I would be careful there because you're talking to two salespeople. So we'll just say yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, next question. How much manual effort was necessary to achieve the shown quality? Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, the one thing that uh, Quantum Spatial tries to uh, um, provide is um, uh, when it comes to a frame based uh, image. Uh, uh, produce digital ortho is to reduce any <laughs> lines or um, uh, any uh, smearing or, or any of those types of scratching or haze that might come of it. Um, the, when you do have uh, use the latest and greatest in terms of sensors, you tend to use the latest and greatest in terms of software. And uh, some credit needs to go to um, the uh, availability of the software and having a technician, a quantum spatial technician, use that software to do it. So I don't have a percentage of how much additional effort, manual effort was achieved in addition to our normal process that we do. Um, uh, I, I can't put a percentage on it. It might be something that we can look into uh, uh, further, but I don't have a percentage there. Okay. We do have uh, several rounds of production and then QC during that production time to make sure that all of those boxes are checked and quality met. As we, as we uh, achieve a second and third and fourth generation imagery product for clients, they get very uh, accustomed to high quality data. So the data needs to be as good or better um, and they, they're becoming very uh, educated customers. This is not like the late 90s or, or early 2000s where uh, the advent of the digital sensor um, was exponentially better than field based. Um, we're now uh, dealing with customers that have through five different rounds of it. So quality is always of a mandate there. Okay. Uh, Philip Walter is asking if you use ground control points and if so, how is that accomplished? Uh, we did. We did photo uh, for the Cape Cod uh, region. We did uh, photo identifiable. So post acquisition, um, uh, I, I don't think they were anticipated targeting for mainly for the fact or pre-targeting mainly for the fact that they had existing imagery and LIDAR for the area. And although there are some geographic changes, um, it's mostly in man-made er developed areas rather than geographical changes. So um, we use photo identifiable points. I don't have a full number, but we have a fairly, um, it was a fairly dense amount to achieve the, or exceed the desired accuracy from a 7.5 centimeter digital ortho uh, product. For, for Tongas, we had um, 
you know, a lower resolution and, and corresponding lower accuracy, uh, but still requires ground control. And so similarly, we use photo identifiable points, some of them existing from recent projects, um, but certainly did have control out there. Okay. Well, we are 45 minutes into the hour, and unless we have one more question, uh, out of respect for everyone's time, uh, I suppose we can close out. Uh, Drew and Adam, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing this information. Uh, I know I benefited from it. I hope our audience did too. Uh, again, this was recorded, and we will send out the link to the recording. You have our email aliases in case you want to forward on uh, any remaining questions that you may have. And please note that this is the first in our uh, IFI OCHCAM series and that we will be having others um, that uh, will be announcing shortly where we will feature other uh, customers like Quantum uh, that are doing great things with Ultracam. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>